Hello class, Professor Dwight Hughes here with another lecture for NTech 224 Cisco CCNA Connecting Networks. This is Chapter 3, Point-to-Point -point Connections. We'll take a look at different types of point-to-point -point connections, how to configure and troubleshoot them. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain the fundamentals of point-to-point -point serial communications across a WAN. Be able to configure a simple HTLC encapsulated point-to-point -point serial link. Be able to describe the benefits of using PPP over HTLC in a WAN environment. Be able to describe the PPP layered architecture and the functions of both LCP and NCP. Explain how a PPP session is established. Configure PPP encapsulation and configure PPP authentication and use different show and debug commands to troubleshoot PPP functionality. It's quite a bit. Well, let's take a look at an overview of what PPP is. Point-to-point -point connections, I sometimes call them the garden hose network, meaning that water in a garden hose always comes out predictably in one place. You put it in one place, it comes out one place, it, it never goes two places or three places. So point-to-point -point, uh, serial links uh, have exactly one uh, one in and one out. So there are, uh, they interconnect two sites and only two sites. Okay. They're commonly called a leased line. A leased line is the most common type of point-to-point -point connection, although you can have a, a circuit-based point-to-point -point connection as well. Communications across the serial connection is a simple method of data transmission where the bits are transmitted sequentially over a serial channel. In parallel, which is not what we're doing, you would use multiple wires. So that's why they're called serial connections, one bit after another. This is what it might look like. You have the bits being sent over the physical medium to the other location. Notice in orange there, it says physical medium, that uh, that's actually just a logical arrow. The actual physical medium goes up into that WAN cloud and down. So they're just saying that eventually it's, it's as if those two routers are directly cabled together like they are with the magic blue cables we use in the lab. In the lab, we use those blue serial cables. I call them magic blue cables because they don't have a WAN in the middle. A WAN would involve a bunch of switches and modems and other equipment to interconnect those locations, which we essentially in the lab use the equivalent of that um, orange physical medium arrow that you see in this diagram. In the real world, we would have a cable on each device going into a modem going into a WAN circuit. Some of the standards for this would be RS-232, V35, and HSSI. Those are all WAN serial communication standards. Point-to-point -point links can connect to geographically distant sites. A carrier, that would be an ISP, dedicates specific resources for your connection. Point-to-point -point links are usually more expensive than shared services because those resources are dedicated to your connection. We use what's called time division multiplexing on our point-to-point -point links. This allows us to mux. Mux is a term for multiplexing. So we mux or multiplex um, multiple signals into one, as shown in this illustration. So say you're running a voice call and a video conference and an email and a web page. What it does is send a few, uh, few bits from one, a few bits from the other, a few bits from the other, and kind of meshes those together. Um, similar to how freeways work, where we all kind of merge our traffic onto one roadway, and then we merge back off as we, as we exit on the exit interfaces. And so that's called muxing and demuxing. And so uh, we call this time division multiplexing or time slicing of our bandwidth. And so we assign each connection a certain percentage of the time slots that make up our available bandwidth. Statistical time division multiplexing is simply a method by which we can use unused time slots. Let's say I had given your uh, application, say the video, 50% uh, of the bandwidth and my voice calls were given 10%. But I could, sure, I could use more. STDM allows me to go over my 10% as, as long as there's unused time slices available. 
so I can go ahead and utilize unutilized time slices. Otherwise, uh, without STDM, everybody would get the number of time slices they were allocated. And if you had more to send than that, even if someone else wasn't using all their allocated spaces, you wouldn't be able to uh, optimize those and they would just travel empty. So STDM is a uh, variable time slot technology allowing uh, the channels to compete for free slot space. Let's uh, look at muxing. Notice we have the different bit rates coming in at uh, 2.5 gigabits per second in the incoming streams. So we have four incoming streams of 2.5 gigabits per second. They are muxed to gather into a single 10 gigabit per second stream. That's all we're doing. You just take lower speed lines, aggregate them together in what's called a multiplexer, and you multiplex them all into a combined signal stream. Demarcation point. Demarcation is a legal term, which means where the ISP, the Internet Service Provider's responsibility ends. So you can see by the triangle in these diagrams where the demark is. The demark or demarcation point is the last point at which the provider is legally responsible for your connection. So if you have a problem in the purple box in either of these drawings, if there is an issue with something inside the purple box, that's not their problem. Their problem, now an exception to that would be if the uh, CSU DSU was owned by the provider. So many times in America, um, we do lease, like a cable modem would be leased from a Comcast, say. Uh, they would be responsible for that equipment, so you could ask them to replace it or, or whatever. Um, but they're not really responsible, like the cable from that to your router or your PC or to the wall is really up to you. And if it came unplugged from the wall, all those kind of issues. Where notice internationally in Europe, for instance, um, they are responsible for the uh, CSU, the DCE device. Uh, even powering it. So they have to actually run a power wire to it and power it from the phone company. They can't use your building power. They have to provide their own power. And if it has any problems and doesn't work or the cabling all the way up basically to where it goes in the wall of your building is all their responsibility. So kind of a big difference between the way Europe um, manages these point-to-point -point serial circuits and the way they're done in the United States. And having this cultural awareness on a global level is a good idea because a lot of companies are going to have offices throughout the world and you want to know the subtle differences in what you can expect. Let's talk about the difference between a DTE and DCE. A DTE is sometimes called CPE, Customer Premise Equipment. So Customer Premise Equipment is typically the router, could be a computer, server, it's some piece of equipment that you want to get on the WAN. So it is a piece of equipment that wants to connect to the WAN. But it cannot connect directly to the WAN. Like, let's take your computer in your home. It doesn't have um, the necessary port or circuits to plug directly into a cable from the cable company. Or if you have DSL, you don't have a DSL port on your PC. So you need another device to convert from what the DTE device speaks to what the WAN circuit speaks. So the DCE device is the end of the WAN circuit and it interfaces the DTE into the WAN circuit. So for instance, a DCE, an example would be a cable modem. A cable modem would have an F connector for plugging in or screwing in your coax cable and that would be the WAN side and then it would typically have an ethernet port on the other side to connect to the DTE equipment. So it acts as the intermediary. So you can say that the DCE controls the WAN circuit. It is the job of the DCE to control the WAN circuit. It is the end of the WAN. Here's a look at some of those uh, little serial port cards. So here we have a real serial cable shown in the diagrams in the upper right. You can see the fake or magic blue cable in the left. The diagram on the left, notice it has a tiny connector on both ends. A real serial cable for a Cisco device has a large B35 connector on one end and a small smart serial connector on the other. This is what I call an idiot-proof cable. There's no way to plug this thing in backwards. So it's pretty obvious which end goes where. You can see a serial wick for a router in the picture on the left. 
So clearly the small smart serial connector goes in there. The large block V35 connector would go in the DCE equipment, which is not pictured in this diagram. Bandwidth. Bandwidth is typically measured in increments of 64 kilobits per second. So if you take any of the bandwidths in this table, you could divide them by 64 kilobits per second. Sometimes the top two are referred to singularly as a 56 slash 64 um, bit rate. There's a, a subtle technical difference in whether you get 56 or 64, and it has to do with whether you're using in-band or out-of-band signaling. So if you're using in-band channel signaling, it's going to use what's called raw bit, and it has to borrow some of the 64 kilobits to send the control signaling. If you use out-of-band signaling, and in um, a prior lecture for Chapter 2, we looked at ISDN briefly, and we saw it has a separate delta channel to send the signaling. It then has full 64 kilobit uh, channels. But that's one reason that, say, like a dial-up modem is rated at 56 kilobits per second. The additional bandwidth is needed to um, send the control signal. Okay, WAN encapsulation protocols. So the layer two protocol that we use on the WAN. Some of the common ones would be HDLC, PPP, and SLIP. Others would be X25, Frame Relay, and ATM. Notice that um, Circuit Switched and Leased Line share the same protocols. When we go to Packet Switch, the more modern way to connect, we need a new type of protocol to connect to those more modern packet switched connections. HDLC is actually the original WAN protocol. So um, HDLC was created by the ISO as an example of what a layer two protocol might look like. Cisco has developed their own version of HDLC, which is incompatible with anyone else's. So if you're running HDLC and you're using Cisco equipment, don't get fooled that you can plug it into, say, an HP switch that is also running HDLC. Cisco's HDLC is proprietary. So there is no interoperability between the HDLC encapsulation. It was not written as a defined protocol. It was written as an example. So it's been implemented different ways. So the Cisco version has some extra fields in the header that make it incompatible with others. Here's a look at the fields in the header. And you can see it doesn't have a whole lot of fields, really. We have um, a flag, addressing, and there's not much room for addressing. Look, it's one or two bytes long, so you can only have up to 16 bits of addressing. Because remember for PPP, point to point, we really don't need addressing because the end is pretty well defined. Just like if you point the garden hose at your face and I turn on the water, I know where the water's coming out. So if you send a frame on a PPP connection, you don't really need to from information. More importantly would be this control information that controls some of the functionality of, of how the frames are sent. And then we stuff the data in there, then we have some air checking and another flag. The flags denote the beginning or end, and notice they are just one byte in length, and they are a 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. So they're just an 8-bit flag. It's a special sequence of 1s and zeros that alerts the um, endpoints that they are receiving a frame or that the frame has ended. Configuring HDLC is super easy. Go into the serial port and type encapsulation HDLC. You're done. However, if you want to connect to non-Cisco devices or use any cool features like encryption, uh, authentication, um, all kinds of their load balancing, if you want to do anything advanced, you can't do it with HDLC. Remember, it was designed as just a very simple example or template of what a Layer 2 protocol should be. It is the default on all Cisco serial ports, but we may want to change it to PPP. That PPP protocol is well-defined and it is multi-vendor, so you can interconnect any brand of device that also supports the PPP protocol. Let's look at troubleshooting. Well, you'd want to make sure your port came to an up-up status. Very common with a serial WAN is to get an up-down status. That usually means a protocol mismatch. 
That means the protocol on one end does not match the protocol set on the other. So scrolling your eye down, you'd want to verify the protocol. It could be things like the Keep Alive or the CRC is turned off. Those have to match. All those settings have to match from end to end. So if you change a setting on one side of a PPP serial interface, you must also do the same to the other. If I do the other command, show controllers, you may not have done this one yet. This is a really cool command. It lets you look at the layer one settings. So this tells me I have a DCE V35. Don't you remember in class, we go up to the magic blue cable and we have to read the label on the blue cable to see which end was the DCE. Well, if you were in a real world environment and you weren't able to physically, you know, drive over and look at these cables, you could just type this command and it will tell you if this end of the cable is DTE or DCE. Okay, let's talk about line status. Up, up, or down, down, or a third one, which they don't have here, is up, down. Line is up, protocol is down. So three different statuses. And then they list some possible conditions uh, that might cause that, and then some of the solutions uh, that you need. The first one, again, is a giveaway. If it's up, up, there, uh, it means everything's working and there's nothing you need to do. But if anything is down, if the line protocol is down, I mean, if, if, it, if it's down, down, then you probably have a physical problem, like the cable doesn't really run there, might have come out or was miscabled the wrong place, um, or you might have some uh, physically damaged equipment where uh, you don't have um, the ability for it to come up. But the second down is the protocol down, and, and you see some examples here where you can uh, check on those. There's the different things to check. Clock rate's another one. And these are all in your online curriculum and your textbook. I won't go through them in detail. Let's look at PPP operation. PPP is really the protocol of choice for point-to-point -point link. In fact, it's called PPP for a reason. It's point-to-point -point protocol. It was um, an improvement on HDLC. It's based on HDLC, but adds a lot of new functionality. So where HDLC is the default and just a very basic um, connection from end to end that doesn't require any configuration. In fact, there is no configuration for HDLC, just that single command encapsulation HDLC. With PPP, we have what's called um, LCP and NCP. So LCP is the link control protocol and that's got the job of bringing up the link, maintaining the link in an up status, and then taking the link down or hanging up at the end. And LCP, once the link is up, hands over control to NCP. And NCP is a protocol dependent module that handles one protocol. You can run many of them like IPv4, IPv6, Apple Talk, pretty much anything. And that can all simultaneously use that link. Each one is assigned its own NCP to handle that layer three data. So is the job of NCP to communicate with layer three. So NCP takes the packet from layer three, puts in the layer two frame, and hands it to LCP that sends it out on the wire. So you can think of it that way, that LCP is controlling the layer one aspect of the communication. So it's the layer two, LCP is a layer two protocol controlling layer one circuits. NCP is a layer two protocol controlling the layer three packets. PPP is an industry standard. It can be used by any manufacturer. It's got many features. One of my favorite is link quality management. This allows you to set a threshold of errors that if you get too many errors on the link, it'll hang up and reconnect. If you've ever had a bad cell phone call where you can't hear the other person, what do you do usually? Hey, let me try to call you back. I got a bad call here and you'd hang up and call them back, hoping to get a clearer connection. Well, PPP is smart enough if you set an error rate and say, look, if the errors on this link reach this threshold, I want you to hang up and reconnect because that, that shouldn't be happening. And so other connections will just um, soldier through really high error rates. So they might have a 99% loss on a link and they're still sending without hanging up that link. 
And we know with a WAN circuit, sometimes you just get a bad circuit. And the only way to fix it is to reset it by taking it down and bringing it back up. Who in the lab has not done that by either pulling the magic blue cable out and plugging it back in or typing shut down, no shut to bring that interface back up. And that's essentially what LCP is able to do if you set a link quality management feature. It's optional, but if you set it, the LCP and PPP will take the link back down and bring it back up. Additionally, it supports features like authentication where you can set a username and password and it won't connect to an endpoint unless that endpoint authenticates its identity. So this is a nice graphical drawing of how NCP and LCP work together to control the link. What I would do if this was my diagram is extend LCP to the right and left a little bit to show that the link is brought up by LCP before NCP is brought up. So LCP runs uh, through the NCP part here, but LCP also handles session establishment. So over to the left where you're establishing the session, LCP runs on its own. And then at the end after NCP is all done and the last packet has been sent, NCP shuts down and then LCP handles shutting down the link. So you can see that here, the bullet points one and three are not really shown well in this diagram, but LCP does also bring up and take down the link. This diagram is focused on that middle part where NCP is also active working with LCP. Okay, and one of the cool features of PPP is it is multi-protocol. Um, some of the layer two protocols we study are not multi-protocol and they can only work with one layer three protocol. Well, because um, LCP and NCP are built around a modular technology, PPP was able to keep adding new NCP modules for each layer three protocol. So it supports all the layer three protocols. Here are the fields in a PPP frame. Again, not very many fields. It's a pretty short frame. If you look, it looks very similar to an HDLC frame. It is based, after all, on an HDLC frame. They did add an extra field, the protocol field. You see, it's got an extra field over HDLC, but it does all of its magic with that extra 16 bits. Um, pretty amazing. So it goes through phases. Now I already alluded to that. In phase one, we call link establishment. It's going to be LCP alone connecting to LCP on the other end to connect this link. Then phase two, LCP is going to test the link if you set the optional test. And it may also do authentication. So this is where it will do the link quality test and also optionally will test for authentication. And now in phase three, LCP will hand control over to NCP. LCP is still running underneath to keep the link active, but NCP is now turned on and starts sending packets. So look over the main jobs of LCP. It's important to know what it does. Basically it does link establishment, link maintenance, and link termination. Here's a look at LCP operation. So you can see the different phases. First, it's setting up the connection. And notice then we finally have NCP drops in after LCP has brought the connection up. Then NCP runs and then in the background, LCP continues to run during the data exchange to keep the link active. And then when there's no more data being exchanged, LCP will terminate the link. Here's a look at the LCP packet. Here are the LCP codes. We have lots of configuration options with PPP. It's a very um, sophisticated protocol. There's actually two types of authentication you can use. PAP, which you'll have a lab setting up, and CHAP, where you also have a lab. CHAP is superior to PAP. CHAP is a challenge um, handshake authentication protocol that randomly challenges you for the password during the connection and also sends everything as a MD5 hash 
where PAP sends the password as plain text and only authenticates the connection at the very beginning. So whenever you have a choice, you should set up chat. Also, you can set up compression, which can be handy if you have a tight bandwidth situation, a low bandwidth link. Yeah, you can have PPP basically zip compress everything to a um, smaller, smaller size and send it and then uncompress it on the other end. It does add additional CPU um, cycles, but it can save you a fair amount of bandwidth on a link that's congested. Also, PPP, very cool feature, has multi-link, allowing you to connect um, a whole bunch of WAN links. Say you had a couple WAN links going to the same place, like two T1s, you could bundle them together and get them to logically function like they were a single link with double bandwidth. And if, uh, of course, if one of them dropped out of the bundle, PPP would just keep operating, but at a lower bandwidth. We look at NCP, the job of NCP, there it is. Notice it's right in the middle between LCP. And a common thing missed on the test is LCP is also running during the NCP um, phase there in the middle. Configuring PPP, all right, how do we set this thing up? Well, all of these are optional. So these are options. You don't have to do authentication. You don't have to do compression. You don't have to do error detection. You don't have to do callback. That's one we didn't talk about. That adds a bit of security. And don't have to multi-link. So here's the basic configuration right there. One command, encapsulation PPP, done. So if you went to both sides, remember by default, it would be set to HDLC. You can just change it to encapsulation PPP and boom, it works. So if you don't want to set up any of the options, that's all there is to basic PPP. Now, if we want, we could set up some of the options, like how about compression? So now I could add an extra command and I could say compress. There's several compressions you can use, predictor or stack. And, you know, just on different types of traffic, you know how there's different compression algorithms for different types of traffic, like MP3 is one we use for music and zip is a, um, uh, a lossless one that we use for data. Well, predictor and stack are two uh, different ones. I prefer stack myself, um, but there are there are differences. So it, it really depends on the type of uh, traffic that, that you're sending. They both work, but um, you'll find in different usages that some will compress at a higher ratio than others and use less CPU. And you can read up, you could Google research uh, these two algorithms and see which one would work with the type of traffic mix you're most often to see on that link. This is the uh, quality, the error rate. So here I can set a quality percentage of 80% that basically um, is going to drop the link if I can't maintain an 80% throughput. So if 20% uh, uh, error rate, then it's going to drop the link. And of course it brings it right back up, but it's going to reset the link. Here's multi-link, and you have a lab to set up all these, so you have lab activities for each of these, but what you're hopefully seeing is each setting is really only a couple commands. It really is not a big deal. When we get to authentication, that's a little more involved, but these first features of um, compression and uh, multi-link are, are pretty easy. We can take a look at the status. This is showing that uh, the encapsulation is PPP, that LCP is open, and these are the open protocols running. So we have IPv4, IPv6, and a couple others. Okay. Here's verifying um, a multi-link. I can see that I've got two ports in this multi-link and they're both active. So I've got two serial ports. Multi-linking is a single uh, link. So again, all it allows you to do if those links go exactly the same destination, it allows you to load balance across them and double your bandwidth or triple or quadruple, however many links you want to put in the bundle. Now we've talked about authentication. Remember there are two choices here. You could do PAP, which is simple authentication, two-way handshake, and it sends the password as plain text. Wow, that's a big um, no. Try CHAP if you can, it has a more advanced three-way handshake and it sends the password as an encrypted MD5 hash. Okay, you have a lab where you're gonna set both of these up so we won't spend a lot of time on this, um, but the setup is almost identical other than changing the word PAP to CHAP. 
but the functionality is very different. So be sure to read up on the difference between a two-way and a three-way handshake. PPP encapsulation authentication process. Here's a nice flowchart if you want to kind of go through um, that. We are not going to set up um, server authentication, but PPP could also also um, read passwords out of a active Microsoft Active Directory or some database on your network instead of the ones we'll be using where we just locally make up a username and password for each link. You could actually use ones that are centrally managed on a server. And here's the command. One command for authentication, but notice it has a lot of options. So you definitely want to practice this in the lab, get it down in your notes, because um, there are a lot of options to add to it. Here's a look at it being set up. This is PAP authentication right here. This is CHAP authentication. Notice they are almost identical. Troubleshooting. Okay, well, debug can be real helpful when we're troubleshooting a serial encapsulation problem because we can take a look at the negotiation or the errors or the authentication or the compression. Notice the different things that we might want to troubleshoot. In this case, I just want to verify that PPP is authenticating. Maybe I can't get my serial link to come up. It always goes up, down, or it keeps resetting, going up, down, up, down. And I go, wow, I wonder what's going on. I could type debug PPP authentication and notice I'm getting a message here that says unable to authenticate, no name received from peer. So it looks like someone has not set a username for this link. So someone did not create a username password for this link. It also says no password defined for username pioneer. So we've got a username with no password and we've got no username. We've got just weird stuff going on. So someone has not correctly set up authentication. They turned it on, but that, so they would have turned on CHAP authentication, but they failed to either set it up on the other side or they failed to set a username password. So it tells us where to start looking for where we might be missing or having something wrong in our config. So in summary, Point-to-point -point links are usually more expensive than shared services. However, they have many benefits. Um, they're um, a, a, good, a good choice for large companies. We took a look at STDM and how it's a more efficient use of bandwidth. We uh, discussed the legality of demarcation points. What's a DTE? What's a DCE? What's CPE? All these new acronyms. We talked about Cisco HDLC as a basic layer two encapsulation protocol. And then we talked about the far superior PPP protocol.